Hello everyone and welcome to Biohackers Lab. I'm your host Gary Cohen and on today's episode I have Frank Tufano. Frank is known for following a raw carnivore diet on YouTube and advocating for the importance of high vitamin animal foods. He has been following what he considers the healthiest diet for six years. This is one with the least amount of inflammation and only consuming foods that our ancestors would have. Frank, thanks so much for coming on for an episode for today. No, thank you, Gary. Uh, I'm excited to give you guys my perspective on the carnivore diet and what I've been doing for, I guess, what I would like to consider my professional dietary career. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. You're my first professional dieter on the on the show. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I actually had a previous guest, uh, Bart K. He dropped your name in here. And yeah, that sent me down a rabbit hole. And of course, I've just actually really enjoyed watching your videos you you do do very good youtube videos and I, i've enjoyed the content that, that you produce there so far and, and i'm pretty sure listeners are going to do the same today um so we mentioned the carnivore diet raw carnivore diet we're going to explore that topic a bit more but i'd just be interested to find out um how did you actually come across the carnivore diet in the first place all those years ago mm -hmm. so coming from a bodybuilding background and in hindsight me taking the drug accutane uh, really ruined my digestive system. Ever since I took that drug, I wasn't able to follow my old bodybuilder diet. But I was having these symptoms. Energy was low. was eating five pounds of sweet potatoes a day. Didn't really know what to do. But all I knew was that working out every day for two hours in the gym wasn't healthy. And eating five pounds of sweet potatoes a day wasn't healthy. So I literally started Googling, what's the healthiest diet? I came across Paul Check's YouTube channel and He's a very successful holistic nutritioner, has his own institute, but he turned me on to Weston Price, who was a dentist in the early 1900s that explored various indigenous groups. And then Paul Cech also turned me on to Nora Goodgaddis, who wrote the book Primal Body, Primal Mind. What I grasped from Weston Price's book was the importance of the nutrient density of animal foods. And what I grasped from Nora Goodgaddis's book was the importance of being in a ketogenic metabolism. So I combined the two ideas animal food nutrient density and ketogenic. And it made sense to me because you could technically be on a keto animal foods based diet if you only consumed animal fats. So I figured that a paleo keto diet was the healthiest diet. But unfortunately, a paleo keto diet based around animal foods is technically pretty much a carnivore diet. Uh, because I didn't really see any nutritional properties in plant foods. That was a little bit confusing to me. So I said, let me do pal let me do keto paleo. Is there any actual diet that's related to this? And I discovered the carnivore diet. It was called zero carb, and it still is called zero carb at the time, back about six years ago. And I was actually looking at that diet, but I remember not actually looking into it because I read the brief description of the diet. But the glaring issues for me with the carnivore diet were they didn't seem to care about nutrient density and they didn't seem to care about macronutrient ratios of fat to protein. And for me, those two things were uh, pretty important, uh, especially considering uh, after I started reading about the carnivore diet, there were some very unusual beliefs that didn't make sense to me uh, from things like you shouldn't salt your food. And, and there were a couple of things that were written in these anecdotes of people uh, that had established that diet for before that didn't really have any you know, scientific or explanation behind them outside of anecdotes. Uh, so I was like, well, this isn't really for me. So I just did my own keto paleo thing for like three to four years until I started making YouTube videos. And then about two years into making YouTube videos, the carnivore diet started becoming more and more popular. So I decided to kind of market my videos towards the carnivore diet. And I got bunched in with the rest of the carnivore dieters. Although I wouldn't say I follow a carnivore diet. And that's why there tends to be a bit of a discrepancy between the diet I follow and what other people tend to do. It has to do with the original premise and why I'm following the diet I'm following. Okay. So what is, the, if you had to explain it then, you're not on a strict carnivore diet? I Technically speaking, I am on a strict carnivore diet, but the dietary beliefs that I follow aren't necessarily carnivore. So for me, the most important thing is that you have a base amount of nutrients in your diet from these high vitamin animal foods. And in most indigenous groups, that was like 65 to 75% of their caloric intake. The other thing is the removal of inflammatory foods. And while there are plenty of plant foods, there are plenty of 
wild, especially wild plant foods that are not inflammatory to the body. The problem occurs with modern plant foods and unnatural access to food. And this doesn't apply to only plant foods because you could follow a carnivore diet that's not good. If you were following a carnivore diet and only eating high omega-6 meats like commercial chicken, commercial pork, commercially raised eggs, a bunch of processed meats, sausages, charcuterie, the difference between that and an Inuit Eskimo who is eating caribou and wild fish, they might as well be on two different planets. So just because someone's following a carnivore diet does not necessarily mean they are following a healthy diet. But for the most part, yeah, I mean, most people on the carnivore diet are achieving the removal of inflammation. Uh, the only thing that I want people to understand about me that I haven't really conveyed too well in the past is that I have no problem with plant foods. What I have a problem with is modern plant foods. And what people need to understand about plant foods is that they were consumed for energy and out of necessity. You know, humans were surviving. Uh, when they consumed grains, the role that grain plays in, you know, human history is replacing wild plant foods. So the animal foods have always been present in our diet. But in the past few thousand years, instead of, you know, foraging for grain, uh, not foraging for grains, foraging for plants, these wild plant foods, Depending on the climate, we decided to harvest wheat, harvest rye, make bread instead. But that's only been for the past few thousand years. Um, I just don't see anything inherently wrong with the wild plant foods our ancestors, used, our ancestors used to consume. The issue I have is that that apple in the supermarket is what? The equivalent of like five apples that might have been in the wild. Not only that, it's much lower in nutrients. And you could literally look up wild plant foods and their vitamin C content, they're literally hundreds of times higher in vitamin C than oranges. These plant foods were much lower in sugar, much lower in calories, had higher vitamin and mineral content. They are nothing like what we are consuming now from supermarkets. That being said, are there some acceptable plant foods? I think so. But at the end of the day, it will always be from an energy or caloric perspective. There's never going to be even enjoyment. You know, there's nothing wrong with eating something because you enjoy it, but you have to understand that these plant foods don't actually have any vitamins or minerals that will contribute to physical development, your overall health. You know, when I was referring to vitamins and minerals and plant foods, what I mean is there might be some electrolytes, there might be some plant forms of vitamins, but their availability isn't comparable to animal foods. I can go further into that, but um, that that's just the overall premise of what I do. I, although I do follow a carnivore diet, I don't necessarily advocate for it when I'm advising people on diet or just, I, I, it's just something that I'm probably unique in that sense that, you know, a lot of these, a lot of people in the carnivore community don't really have this perspective. Mm -hmm. So in this case, what I'm getting here is that if you were in a geolocation somewhere in the world where you had wild plants, you'd be okay if someone was foraging. Of course, but the other thing to keep in mind is if the indigenous group had access to as much meat as they wanted, it, it tended to be like 75 to 80% of their calories. So they would still consume maybe 20% of their calories from plants, but the only reason that they would consume more calories from plants would be out of necessity. So, you know, you have the Inuit Eskimos and certain carnivorous tribes, the reason they were 95, 99% carnivore is because they didn't have access to these plant foods. And if you have an indigenous group that's in, I think there was some South American jungles, they were consuming like 45 to 50% of their calories from animal foods, but they were much shorter than the other indigenous groups. And the reason they did that was because of their lack of access to animal foods. They didn't consume 55% plant foods because they wanted to. It's because they had to. Same thing if we look at these blue zones now, blue zones do have very high life expectancy rates. And if you look at the macronutrient ratios in their diets, blue zones actually have the same as Americans. It's interesting. Both Americans and blue zones consume 30% of their calories from animal foods and 70% of their calories from plant foods. But when we look at plant versus animal ratio in the diet throughout human history, it's generally been dependent on the location, the climate, and what foods they have access to. It We've never actually had a choice, which to me is super interesting. Uh, but I mean, I, saying that we never had a choice is somewhat incorrect because there were some Plains Indians that, you know, as I said earlier, when they did get to choose, 
they would opt for the heavily animal-based diet and they would only eat some foods out of enjoyment, whether it's berries or certain wild plants. But by no means were they harvesting like rye bread or eating hundreds to thousands of wild plants like some indigenous Aborigines were. It really is dependent on the region and the climate and uh, how, I guess, how adept they were at hunting. And it could even be an issue with season. Maybe it was unusually cold. Maybe it was unusually hot. Maybe something happened. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you were talking about meat quality earlier, that seems like a big one for you. And that is quite a heavily discussed topic in the carnivore community. Hey, can I just get any kind of meat because of the budget that I have versus maybe going for a, a potentially more expensive meat, um, which is grass raised or pasture raised. In your case, then, what are the sources of meat or the types of meat that you find that you you source? Yeah, so the the premise behind this is, you know, from a logical perspective, indigenous people and our past ancestors only had access to high quality meat. You know, this new factory farming thing, the meat we have access to now, it's it's unnatural in a way. It's almost as unnatural as that apple in the supermarket. You could argue, uh, if someone decides to consume whatever meat they can afford on a carnivore diet. Granted, it's not like high omega-6 inflammatory meats. They're still going to reduce the nutrient density, uh, not the nutrient, uh, they're still going to reduce the inflammation in their diet. So if you only ate commercially grain-fed beef from the supermarket, you would remove most inflammation from your diet. What you're missing out on is the nutrients. And there's also a possible negative connotation with you know, the antibiotics, whatever negative things were in the feed of the animal. And I did a video, and this was maybe three, four months ago, comparing grain-fed to grass-fed steak. And if you actually taste the fat on a grain-fed steak when it's raw, it's essentially inedible. Uh, once, you once you cook the steak, once you cover it up with salt and pepper, it becomes edible. And if you taste the grass-fed steak raw, it's actually, it actually tastes okay. Uh, this becomes more apparent in fat of the animal as the fat is where the toxins are stored. And this is very apparent in the liver. Uh, the reason a lot of people don't like liver is because it's bitter, it's astringent, it tastes weird, it tastes terrible. And they're right, it does taste terrible because you're buying conventional grain-fed liver. Liver is supposed to have little to no flavor, it's supposed to be mild and sweet, and the quality of the animal is not always indicated in the muscular tissue, but the muscular tissue is what most people are consuming. So th this whole thing is hard for people to kind of grasp and understand. And I remember one time I bought some grain-fed bone marrow and some grass-fed bone marrow to compare it. I put the grain-fed bone marrow in my mouth and it tasted like acrid, acidic corn, like pl Play-Doh. It was horrendous. The grass-fed marrow was good. It was like mild, sweet, nutty. So for me, having that raw aspect in my diet and tasting these foods and looking at them and understanding them, I've developed this palatability oriented around you know, it's like if you went into, let's say you, you know, if you had these animals in front of you in nature and you started tasting the animal as it was when you slaughtered it, there's a reason certain parts of the animal taste as they do. This is going a little bit off topic, but the food palatability in the context of a wild animal is much different than a modern grain fed animal. So the marbling that we see on these ribeye steaks, ground beef, these foods never really existed. The parts of the animal that we used to eat were the fat deposits, the short rib section, the brisket, where the animal stored fat, the marrow, because wild animals don't have marbled ribeyes. You know, I'm sure a lot, plenty of you guys have bought grass-fed ribeye. I'm sure plenty of you guys are hunters and have hunted venison. You'll notice that fatty deposits are only in certain parts of wild animals. So a big part of, you know, food sourcing and food quality and people not really buying high-quality food ties in with our disconnect from what animals are naturally supposed to be like and especially the cuts of the animal. But to answer the question on, you know, what I do is I'll go, you know, I go to local supermarkets, I go to local farms and I essentially just buy grass fed meat. Now, although the nutrients aren't stored in the muscle meat, they're stored in the fat. Muscle meat does contain fat. So if you took Let's say you take a lean piece of meat from a grain-fed animal and you pair it up with a grass-fed piece of fat. That's essentially the same thing as a fatty grass-fed ribeye steak. So 
since the nutrients of the animal are contained in the fat, what you want to prioritize in your diet is the fat quality, not necessarily the muscle meat quality. And that's the reason I tell people it doesn't really matter what muscle meat you're eating because the nutrients are contained in the fat and the organs. So if someone was to buy something like an egg, that is a concern where the egg does have fat in it. If someone was going to buy cheese, that's where the quality does tie in. Any dairy products, that's where the quality ties in. Uh, so for me, the most important thing is that the source of fat in your diet is coming from a high quality. Now, considering most people on the carnivore diet tend to just buy steak, I think, and ground beef, the difference between you eating two pounds of grass-fed ground beef and two pounds of grain-fed ground beef is completely dependent on the pasture. The animal could have been grass-fed, but it could have been low-quality pasture. So maybe the vitamin content in the grass-fed meat was only like two to three times higher. But we've seen levels of certain fatty acids, and this study was linked in my grain-fed versus grass-fed video. Sometimes like the linoleic or the linolenic acids in the meat can be 10 times higher. The vitamin E, the vitamin A, the carotene content in the meat can be five times higher. But is this relevant when you can consume liver and get 200 times the amount of vitamin A that's in muscle meat? That's the issue with me. If you are concerned about the nutrient density in your diet and that you can't afford the higher quality meat, there's essentially three nutrients that you're missing out on by only consuming grain-fed meat. It's vitamin A in the form of retinol, and that's mostly found in liver. It's vitamin K2, and that is in high-quality animal fats, but if the animal wasn't on pasture, there, there's vitamin K1 in grass. If the animal's not eating grass or various wild things that like a pig could forage in the forest, the, the animal fat is not going to have the K2 present. And the third thing is omega-3 fatty acids, same thing. The animal needs to consume foods that its gut bacteria will turn into these nutrients. If it's being fed, if it's being fed a commercial grain diet, it, that's not going to happen. Now, since you're missing out on these three nutrients, what are the alternatives? For vitamin A, you could take a cod liver oil supplement. You can eat a little bit of liver every week. For vitamin K2, you could take a cod liver oil. Um, I mean, there is some K2 in cod liver oil. There are also K2 supplements. K2 is very high in foods like egg yolks, cheese, really any high quality animal fat. And then for omega-3s, I think just about half the people in America are taking a fish oil supplement. And omega-3 is also in cod liver oil. So interestingly enough, a food like cod liver or a lot of livers in general can really knock out all of your micronutrient requirements. So, you know, the difference between someone consuming a grain-fed diet and adding these supplements in versus me, yes, there are differences. The forms of the vitamins are different, uh, but the goal can be achieved either way. Um, yeah, I, was... I think that's, a, yeah, that's a pretty good way of explaining it. But um, the only concern here is, you know, are there negative things about antibiotics or possible altered omega-6 ratios in animals? Uh, you know, if you are eating something like a large amount of grain-fed eggs for vitamin K2, is there a downside to consuming all the omega-6 from those, that low-quality egg source? And, and then, of course, we have the issue of, you know, the food volume, are you satiated? Uh, to, to me, if, if it really is a matter of not being able to afford the higher quality animal foods, it's doable, but I mean, we, you can make it work. Mm -hmm. So then you brought up a good topic there with eggs. Are you pro egg? Well, this brings in allergies. So that's, that's the other concern. So if you have a product in the supermarket, like Kerrygold butter, Kerrygold butter is pasteurized butter uh, and the difference between pasteurized butter and raw butter is that the fat is oxidized in the, um, the pasteurized butter. That can cause allergic reactions to people. That can be inflammatory. Uh, but the main issue here is whether or not you're allergic to the casein. Uh, the main issue for eggs is how well you tolerate the high omega-6 if you have an egg allergy. So although I am pro-dairy consumption and pro-egg consumption, for me, it's always a matter of you know if you're going to buy eggs. I, I mean, I used to go buy pay seven, eight dollars a dozen for soy free pasture raised duck eggs. Uh, for butter or dairy products, I used to go to the farm and pay twelve, fourteen dollars a pound for high quality raw butter uh, for my family. But personally I'm allergic to both eggs and dairy. I can't tolerate them. So for me it's a little different in a sense that I usually just go buy foods that come straight off the animal. 
and whether it's fish or meat. And if I, I mean, you know, working in New York City as a personal trainer, bartender, doing all these things, you know, I've been involved in, and if I go out to a restaurant, uh, you know, I do focus on meat based dishes, but if they put an egg on my steak tartare, you know, I'll probably eat it. Like for me, having one egg is not too much of an issue. For me, having a pad of butter on my steak isn't too much of an issue. The issue is if I incorporate these foods I'm allergic to in large amounts in my diet. So what you really have to do is you have to gauge, you know, what is the source of the food? Is it high quality? Why are you eating it? And is it causing a reaction? So I, I mean, I know people that can on keto that can tolerate a stick of grain fed butter every day. If I did that, I have a pizza face full of acne. So it really is dependent on the person. Uh, I mean, there are downsides to every single food. You know, I can look at whatever food it is, think of the downsides, whether it's having pasteurized cheese versus raw cheese. There's so many pros and cons from the nutrient content of the food, whether it has the vitamins that it's naturally supposed to have, or whether or not there's inflammatory aspects that are relevant to our crazy modern food system. But I mean, a lot of these things can be answered with, and I, I really do hate having to use native diets and indigenous diets as examples for everything. Although I do like looking at, you know, the science behind, okay, why is the vitamin content different when the cows fed grass versus grain? Why do people get allergic reactions from, you know, pasteurized cow's milk versus raw sheep milk? If you can look back at whether or not the food was obtainable in a natural environment, that always answers your question. It really does. You know, if we were going to have animals that we were using for dairy products 50, 100 years ago, they would have been consumed raw. If we were going to, you know, we weren't going to go to the supermarket and buy ground beef 100 years ago, that didn't really, I don't know about 100 years ago, but, you know, if we were hunting animals, we would have had whole cuts, fatty parts, different parts of the animal would have been prioritized. And just to sum up this question, I have, I was reading a site the other day, I'll, I'll try to uh, provide it to you. It went over the animal foods in Native American diets, and they literally had about a hundred different types of animal foods in their diet and about a thousand different species. So if they consumed trout, there were maybe 10 different types of trout they would fish. If there were seven types of salmon, they would fish. You know, there was literally hundreds of fish, hundreds of different types of birds, ducks, geese, so many different types of land animals that these indigenous people were consuming. The sheer variety of animal foods in their diet was insane. And here I am eating beef all day. So uh, there's definitely something to be said about the, the variety of animal foods they were eating and the quality of animal foods they were eating. And although we can't, of course, replicate what we were doing back then, what they were eating can help us answer questions about whether or not a product is truly you know, it should be looked at in a sense. You know, it's not that since they didn't do it, we shouldn't be doing it, but it's more of like, okay, well, you know, the eggs they used to consume were from wild animals. So let's compare the wild animal egg to the modern egg. And then that's where we see the very apparent nutritional differences, the fatty acid ratio differences, the accessibility differences. Of course, something like eggs, you know, wouldn't have been, I mean, if you're eating more than two or three eggs a day from a natural perspective, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, but uh, I think that's enough for that. <laughs> I, could, yeah. I could go on and on and on. I really can. So, well, again, that's why I've got you on. I mean, you're a great speaker and you, you've got a lot of good thoughts about things. So we're going to already, we're, we're exploring different things on the carnivore diets, uh, that maybe people haven't heard of already, which is great. I'd be interested on your thoughts then talking about native tribes and, um, indigenous people. If you, I remember watching a documentary, especially up, um, with the Eskimo kind of people, and they do a lot of cured foods uh, where they where they would take a carcass and they'd actually bury it for mm -hmm. a while, so they never mm -hmm. actually have to eat the f the meat fresh, fresh, fresh. What are your thoughts mm -hmm. on that eating? eating I actually meat? was planning on doing a video on indigenous foods well soon, so I did a little write up. Did you want me to read that for you? Um, I can I can read some of that because it's relevant. So, uh, not only is there incredible variance in how many animal foods these indigenous tribes consumed. The preparation methods varied greatly dependent on the animal and the tribe. One group of Inuits would only eat the fat between the intestines of a female bear, literally leaving the rest. And other tribes might have aged all the meat on a rack of a male bear. And most groups would roast, boil, or stew the bear meat 
and then they would render the fat. In some cases, if the animal was are if the animal was large, like a caribou, the hunter would eat some of the meat on the spot and bring bring, bring back the prized parts. Maybe sending tribe members to gather it. Some groups considered the head, the fermented contents of the stomach, and the droppings made into soup delicacies, eating it with blubber. Roasted ribs were favored, boiled kidneys. They would even ferment the liver in the stomach under the hot sun for several days. They ate the ends of the bones. Other groups may have dried out stomach strips and used it to flavor boiled meat. Some preserved bone marrow and tallow by skewering the fat on sticks and drying it out. Some ate it raw. Even just one food like caribou, I could literally talk about for 20 minutes. The variety of preparation they did on foods was, it was literally completely crazy. The same can be said of all meats and fish. Whether it was consumed raw, sun-dried, boiled, mashed with grease, baked, frozen, rotten, smoked, roasted over a fire, fermented, mixed with the stomach contents, it seemed like there was no wrong way to consume animal products in these indigenous groups, as long as it was that original air of high-quality animal food. The, it's, it's really is amazing, the preparation methods and how oddly specific these foods were. Because if you look at one food, salmon, maybe the sockeye salmon would be prepared differently from the king salmon. And, one, and if you had 10 different indigenous groups, they would prepare it 10 different ways. One indigenous group might feed the flesh of the salmon to the dogs and feed the eggs to the woman. One group might smoke the meat and, and then make the eggs into a soup with whale blubber. And this can be said about every single food. So every one of these thousands of animal foods has dozens of different preparations depending on the tribe. The sheer variety, it's, it's, it's actually very overwhelming. It, it truly is. Uh, and I mean, it, it makes sense as to why food, I mean, food plays a large role in people's lives now. But as you can imagine, food was our lives. Our goal was survival. If we have shelter, the next thing we need is food. And that's really all humans are meant to do. If you think about it from a nine to five perspective, humans old nine to five job was procuring food. That's why uh, they're so, they're, they were so good at it. And there are so many methods to it. Mm-hmm. And so in your choice then, You've decided to eat a more raw way with your meat. Would you like to sort of share your thoughts with that one and what you define as raw then to people? Sure. So I guess just we I guess we have to briefly go over what the the benefits of eating cooked meat versus raw meat are. And when you do cook a meat product, you do compromise the vitamin content to some degree. So and this is if you cook it well done. If you're cooking your meat rare and there's it's mostly red in the middle or mostly pink in the middle, you're not losing as many vitamins as I am stating now. If you braise the meat in the oven for one hour, you will lose approximately 40 to 50% of the B vitamins and 10 to 20% of all the other fat-soluble vitamins. And then there is a drastic difference on digestion. Now, the main thing to consider is that every single indigenous group of people consumed both raw and cooked animal foods. So there is no better or worse. But what is safe to say is that certain animal foods are better consumed raw from a taste perspective as well as a nutrient perspective. If you have something like salmon eggs or salmon roe that have a very high nutrient content, especially vitamin C, as with things like liver, those foods are better to consume in a lightly cooked to raw state to preserve most of the nutrition. But just that, you know, the idea that raw is better, cooked is better, and we see this in the vegan community too, I really don't like it. Uh, that's why I, I'm happy that there is an example that we can look at in the indigenous groups that they did both. Uh, so let's say, you know, is there a concern if you are cooking all of your meat well done? Only usually in regards to vitamin C. Uh, in William R. Stephenson's book, The Fat of the Land, it's about an Arctic explorer who went around, uh, had many meals with Inuit Eskimos. And there's a lot of, of reading about scurvy in that book. And it didn't matter how many fruits and vegetables these people consumed. Uh, they still got scurvy. To prevent scurvy, you need fresh food. Doesn't matter if it's a lemon, doesn't matter if it's a piece of steak. If you cook the food extensively, you will remove the antiscorbutic properties. So that's something else that kind of ties into raw versus cooked. But what I noticed on a raw diet or primarily raw diet is the digestion of the meat. So when you cook the meat more, your body produces more waste, the meat digests a little bit quicker. So to my understanding, The purpose of cooking food in human society 
is not to extract more micronutrients from the food, it's to extract more macronutrients from the food. And, you know, if you look at different climates in different parts of the world, like why, like one hypothesis I have about why like Inuits might have been shorter people than the Maasai in Africa, the climate and the, the cold requirement could have been bottlenecking their ability to procure calories. Uh, so, so calories have always had this tie-in to surviving in natural environments. And that's where I think cooking plays a role. But in regards to my personal experiences, I know, as I said, the digestion plays in. Uh, there is a nutrient concern that we touched briefly on. And personally, the, the taste and the texture. Although I do prefer the flavor of cooked meat, if I cook the meat past red or raw, essentially, I don't like the texture. And that, that's something that happened as I progressed on the carnivore diet, you know, consuming high quality foods. But just to give you some context as to what meals I actually consume, I pretty much just take some grass fed steak. I'll throw it on the grill for literally like 20, 30 seconds on each side. The middle is still raw. I mean, people like to make jokes like a good veterinarian could bring that back to life, you know, things like that. Uh, but, you know, the same thing with like jokes in the kitchen. Oh, just wave the steak. Don't even put the steak in the pan. Just put the pan on the burner and then put the steak on the plate and send it out. Uh, just think like jokes like that. But the steak is literally raw. Like it's just a crisp on the outside. I mean, most people might know it as black and blue. That's how I prepare my meat. So although the meat is seared on the outside, in regards to actual percentage of how many calories are coming from cooked versus raw, I mean, it's probably 97 to 95% raw. So although my diet is completely raw, I do sear the outside for flavor. And then the other foods that I consume from liver to eggs to salmon roe, off cuts, fish. Uh, for, for most of the time, the stuff like the liver, the salmon roe, I do raw. Uh, sometimes fish I cook, sometimes I do it raw. But to me, it's it's like what I feel like. I mean, it, to me, I kind of feel like I almost replicate the indigenous groups to some degree. Uh, you know, sometimes I feel like pan searing my steak. Sometimes I feel like um, putting it on the grill. Sometimes I even feel like smoking a brisket for 10 hours. Sometimes I feel like boiling a beef tongue in some some stock I made. And and then maybe I'll even just have some raw salmon roe, some raw liver, uh, sometimes, and eggs, you know, people know eggs can be, pre be prepared a dozen different ways. So for me, as long as I know that the initial food quality is good, the cooking temperature, I don't think it matters too much. That being said, my personal preferences, it's pretty much almost completely raw. Yeah, and that's fascinating too to hear because again, that's one of the big debates when people uh, are consuming an all meat diet: is should I go cook? Should I go raw? What I'm hearing again in your case here is, yeah, there's majority raw, but there's actually even a variety there. There's times you cook, there's times you don't, and then especially there, you're consuming a lot of different types of animal foods too. And I mean, in my case, uh, for the most part, I stick to fatty cuts of meat like brisket, short rib. And that'll be the majority of my calories. I've been tapering off liver to some degree in favor of other off cuts like brain, testicles, marrow. I've been trying to really broaden the spectrum, fish. But it's not necessarily consuming a variety of meat, so to speak. It's just to make sure that you're getting some nutritional completeness. And nutritional completeness can best be summed up as in consuming nose to tail. And nose to tail can literally mean eating an oyster, because you're technically eating the whole animal. So what I'm, get, what I'm trying to explain is that whole animals have all the nutrients you need. So in the case of like an oyster or a crab or a lobster, the whole animal is much easier to eat compared to a cow, because the cow has many organs, many different components. But if you could shrink a cow down to the size of a salmon egg and eat it, it's essentially the same principle because muscle meat might not have too much of any vitamin in particular, but the brain tissue of the animal has DHA primarily. You know, the heart of the animal might be higher in B vitamins. The liver has all vitamins, A, C, D, E, K2. The kidneys are also very rich in vitamins. The fat of the animal is very high in vitamin K2. Each part of the animal has different nutritional properties. And that's a part of the reason why these indigenous people prize certain foods. They correlated nutritional properties to what would happen in their bodies. Uh, but if you consume an oyster, it's essentially the same thing. 
So eating eating nose to tail in the context of a ruminant animal might be more difficult. But if you could just crack an egg into your mouth for breakfast, that's the same thing. Same thing with salmon eggs. Salmon eggs are essentially tiny, tiny salmon. That's why they have all the nutrients the body needs. So one big part of knowing what foods to incorporate into your diet, whether or not you should cook them, ties back into understanding the nutrient profiles of various foods, uh, maybe how indigenous people would have consumed them, and also identifying where in your diet you might you know, be going wrong. And what are your thoughts on pork and chicken? Because that's never discussed so much. Uh, yeah, this is a pretty big topic in itself. And even pastured pork and chicken uh, are an issue because, you know, hypothetically, worst case scenario, it's 100% grain feed. And hypothetically, best case scenario, on a pastured chicken or pig, you're, it's still like 60 to 70% grain feed. So the omega-6 ratios are still off. Uh, I mean, pastured pork and chicken is miles better than commercial store-bought chicken. Pastured pork is literally red. It looks like beef. Uh, and, and the chicken actually is deeper colored too. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys have eaten game birds or wild game birds or geese, but the meat of the birds is red. That's how it's supposed to be. You know, my white meat is not, is not natural, so to speak. Same thing with wild turkey. It's a very different color than commercial turkey. So, you know, if you were going to consume pork, maybe you want to consume bacon for an enjoyment perspective. And if someone tells you they enjoy chicken breast, I think they're lying. But, you know, for me, the alternative is, you know, look at those game meat alternatives. Like instead of, instead of having pork bacon, you can have beef bacon or wild boar bacon. Of course, there's a lot of grunt work associated with this. But then the question is, well, Frank, I like, I like bacon. Can I have two slices of bacon in the morning? I'm not going to say no, that's definitely a lesser evil compared to what most people eat, especially considering how unhealthy everyone is. But for me, I'm just analyzing it from the perfect perspective of indigenous diets. Like obviously, you know, eating bacon is eating only bacon all day would be way healthier than most Americans are. But from the perspective of what indigenous people do, it's, you know, there's a scale, so to speak, a measurement. And, and, and on the topic of the chicken, you know, not only are we concerned about the omega ratios in the meat. We're concerned about the antibiotics, how the animal was raised. Uh, and, and not only that, the nutrients are missing in the food. Not only is there an inflammatory concern from the omega-6 fatty acid ratios, but it doesn't have nutrients in the flesh. And the, the organs are pretty much inedible because of what the animal has been fed. So uh, all that being said, I don't think it's too bad to have if you have pastured pork or chicken and you're paying out your ass for it and you know it's a high quality source, yeah, I'd eat it two, three, four times a week. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't only eat past, I mean, I wouldn't only eat it unless you're raising the animal yourself and you know what it's eating. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, there was a farmer in Connecticut that had 100% pastured, essentially wild animals in his, you know, in the forest. He didn't feed them anything. And he was charging like, even the ground pork was like $17 a pound. So a lot of the times this can be, prohibitively expensive. Um, I mean, same thing with like uh, a farmer, uh, they had some milk fed veal and there are some misconceptions about veal marketing. They'll say it's milk fed veal, but they'll actually feed it a formula and it won't taste right. But does it, like milk fed veal and formula fed meal is, it's really interesting because I've had ground veal that I didn't really like. And then I had actual mother's milk fed veal and I was like, what? Like, how does this taste so good? You know, I literally just put this veal meat in a pan, seared it, put a little salt on it. And as I was eating it, I was like, why does this taste so good? This is insane. And that feeling I get when I eat high quality animal foods in, in regards to the taste is something that I try to replicate in all my meals. Uh, you know, if I go to the supermarket and I buy a crappy quality grass fed steak from Australia and I eat it, I'm like, this is pretty good. But once in a while, I'll go to a farm and I'll get this really nice, deep yellow, orange grass-fed beef fat. I'll put that on the grill. I'll take it off. I'll put some salt on it. I'll take a bite out of that beef fat and I'll be like, what the F? Because the beef fat will literally taste like butterscotch. If you guys haven't, if you guys haven't eaten an animal food and said, holy, shit, why does this taste so good? All I did was put it on a fire. You haven't experienced high quality animal foods. And the easiest way I think to do this would be um, you know, buy some, buy a whole live crab, buy some live lobster. Uh, there, there are certain animal foods that really taste amazing in their natural state. You know, if you go fishing, if you go hunting, you might have experienced this, but if you haven't tasted, uh, and, and here's an interesting thing. I compared 
bacon to lamb fat. And I gave a piece to my mother and the lamb fat tasted 10 times better than the bacon. If you get really high quality meat, you will know it a hundred percent. If you haven't experienced that, try to. And then I'm always interested when I speak to uh, someone like yourself, have you ever come across anyone who's predominantly seafood based on a carnivore diet? Uh, in indigenous groups, there were many that were seafood based. Uh, anecdotally now, it's, it's, it's so, we'll, we'll do a comparison of two tribes. So there's the Maasai, who most people know, they were cattle herders. They ate a lot of blood, meat, and milk. And the and most people don't. Some people don't know the Maasai did eat a, a pretty fair proportion of plant foods, like 30, 35 percent of their calories. Uh, but the Maasai were very tall. Uh, they were known to be well over six foot. The men usually around six foot six. Uh, and then there was another tribe called the Nurs. The N E U. It's N E U R S. The Nurs had similar ratios, except they ate fish instead of meat. So it's evident. That and even in um, in Vilyamar Stephenson's Fat of the Land, the book we spoke about earlier about the Arctic explorer, he examined skeletal remains of two different groups of people. One were the Inuit Eskimos who ate primarily caribou, whale meat, like very you know meaty animal foods, so to speak. And then he examined coastal Florida Indians that only ate shellfish, and their skeletal structures and their bone structures were both perfect. So. It's evident that we can obtain fat soluble vitamin nutrition from both fish and and ruminant animals. What comes up is what is the constituent of following a fish based diet versus a, a meat based diet? And I think it's the, the fuel really because if if you have access to fish, you're missing fat in a way. Uh, so when you're at, when you're eating fish, you have to eat everything of the fish. You have to eat the fishes, and this is something people don't do. They usually throw out the guts. You have to eat the fish's liver. You have to eat the fish's intestines. I did have a video eating fish intestines, but I think it was deleted when I was going to get rid of my channel. So I might have to do that again in the future. But it's hard to get like like large animals, large fish. They usually gut them on the boat so you don't get the organs. And the problem with the small fish is they usually come in frozen and it's like all icky. It's like not good. So the problem with having high quality fish that you could eat the organs in is mainly accessibility, you know? If I went fishing on the Long Island Sound and just ripped the fish out of the ocean, I would gut it and eat the stuff on the spot. Uh, but then there's the pollution concern. Uh, and, and this is the same thing with grain-fed animals. The liver doesn't taste good. It tastes bitter. It tastes astringent. And some livers, fish livers in these indigenous groups, were delicacies. They used to, the indigenous people would talk about how much they loved fish liver, like especially liver of certain animals, and they would boil it, and they loved it. But I taste fish liver, and it's bitter. Definitely has to do with pollution and what what the animals are being fed now, and unfortunately. So, one consideration to have about pescatarians is if you're consuming finned fish to consume the organs as well, and also that shellfish like mollusks, clams, oysters, crab, lobster. These foods played a huge role in the diets of fishermen as well. So you need to eat the whole animal, and that's ideal for nutrient density. But yeah, whether you're following a beef-based diet or a fish-based diet, I don't think you can follow a fish-based carnivore diet because uh, I think these tribes, these groups of people did have other plant foods that were consuming some, they were consuming for some sort of energy. Uh, the reason people are able to follow a carnivore diet on red meat is because of its fat content, because of its calorie content, because uh, fish has a higher moisture content, it's lower in calories, it doesn't have as much fat. It's difficult to obtain calories from fish versus the volume of food you're consuming. Whereas with red meat, it's actually possible. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, hypothetically, if you did tr want to try a pescatarian carnivore diet, uh, I mean, I've tried it myself, but I always just literally three days and then I give up and eat a steak. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'll be honest, that's, what ha that's what's happened every time. And uh, I I've tried doing, unfortunately, I, I mean, I I my stomach is still messed up from Accutane. I've never been able to digest carbohydrates the same way. But I wanted to try, uh, you know, an indigenous, I've tried indigenous diets before. I've tried to do like, Inu like when, that was when I was trying an Inuit Eskimo diet. I was like, all right, I'm only going to eat fish for two weeks. And I was like, all right, screw this. I can't do it. I only lasted three days. And I was like, all right, let me try something else. So what about uh, a Polynesian Islander diet or like the, the Nur diet? 
So I got some wild plant foods. I got some like, not wild plant foods, but I got some sweet potatoes. I got some carbohydrate plant-based sources that I deemed were acceptable. Uh, and then I was going to consume that with fish. And my stomach just couldn't digest it. I think that was because of the previous problems I had from Accutane. So I, you know, if, I, if my stomach was normal, I'd have a lot more anecdotes to experiment with. But I'm sure that most people out there, if you do go pescatarian, if you do try pescatarian carnivore, and you find out that it's not working, uh, try adding in some sort of plant, like high quality plant carbohydrate source and let me know how it goes. Uh, that would certainly be interesting because in the context of an indigenous group, X amount of your calories have to come from animal foods for, uh, for nutrients and X amount of your calories have to come from either carbohydrates or fat is energy. You can't only consume protein for energy. You need fat and carbohydrates in some way. And if the fish is not providing the fat, you need to get fat or carbs from something else. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting with you two, I think you've also done some blood work, have you, over the years? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, just to give some context, uh, I mean, people are always concerned about cholesterol, but my cholesterol has been the same since I was about 16. Uh, it's been, my LDL has been around 220 since I was about 16. On the carnivore diet, it didn't really change. Uh, none of my blood work markers changed. Uh, really over the past 10 years or so. Um, and what also didn't change was my, my doctor tried to put me on a statin when I was like 18, which I think is quack stuff, but I'm, I'm not going to get too much into that. Uh, because when, even when I was, but to me, the most interesting thing is I was literally eating chicken and rice every day and my cholesterol was the same as it is now. Uh, that's what I think is crazy. And I'm sure there's some vegan out there that's going to argue, oh, the chicken was going to kill you or, or something crazy like that. Uh, the, the interesting thing about my blood work might be my testosterone and, uh, you know, I've always had low testosterone and it got worse after I took Accutane, but there was some irregularity in my blood work and because my testosterone level tripled when I did something. Uh, but before I got some blood work today, actually, I didn't, I just got the blood taken. So I haven't seen the results yet. So by next week, I will know for sure what impact this has had on my testosterone. And I'll be able to talk about that in depth. Uh, but did you have any specific, I mean, did I answer the questions and related to blood work? Did we want to touch on anything else specifically? Tri triglycerides, glucose, other blood markers like electrolytes, uh, kidney function, stuff like that? Yeah, I guess, you know, um, kidney function is one that hopefully I had Professor Stuart Phillip on and, and he tried, he, you know, he debunked the myth about protein causing kidney failure but then a lot of people after uh, dr sean baker's results when he shared his results that time always go oh well if you're on a carnivore diet you're basically going to make yourself type 2 diabetic uh, what, what's the premise of, of type 2 diabetes and oh it's because his um he had the high glucose right yeah so he had um yeah it was just the glucose i, I can't remember if it was the a1c but um yeah to me that is so that sounds like he didn't, it sounds like he was, he didn't fast for the blood work long enough. And he I was, would, would, and he was also doing a lot of workouts. So they were talking about athletes who have higher glucose, um, responses due to that could be it too. Uh, but, but generally speaking, an endurance athlete, the, the problem I have is I don't know the whole context of everything he did. Like, uh, Okay, so I don't want to touch on Sean Baker's blood work because obviously there's definitely conversations to be had about testosterone and him being a world-class athlete. That's a conversation that can be had for, for someone else. But on this specific topic of the glucose levels. And your glucose levels, do they go up? No, my glucose has always been really low. Um, I mean, like one, like one time I took it and it was 80 and the next week I took it, it was 100. So there's definitely a lot of variance depending on the fast. So this is what I was getting into though. We don't know what he did. So I could fast for three weeks and my LDL could go up to 350 and then I can eat a meal and my LDL will be 200. A lot of people don't understand how much blood work can vary here. So although I would love to speculate on why his glucose was high, you can't just go off one blood test. What you have to do is you have to say, okay, Sean, fast for two days, get the blood work. Okay. Then fast for one day, get the blood work. And then have a normal day and have the blood work. And then you can compare those three things. And then if we see something like 
Uh, if we do see something like, oh, well, your glucose is high, what was the exercise pattern? And, and Dave Feldman with Cholesterol Code, he does so much work on this. Uh, Dave Feldman has probably spent, I don't know, the guy probably spends thousands of dollars in blood work over the past few years. Uh, and, and he's experimented with anything from high fat to low fat diets. To, and I think he, Dave Feldman recently did something on exercise. So uh, if you haven't had this discussion with Dave, I think he, he would be the person to go to. But my answer to that is there's too much variance in blood markers. Like it, it's absolutely insane. And, and, and not only that, um, the, the main thing that I would answer in regards to blood work, instead of going into all this hypothesizing and theorying and, you know, me really talking out my ass is what's the metric here? What, what are, what are these, uh, standard deviations we're going by, you know, what determine these deviations and how is it applicable to human health in general? Because one metric that I am very comfortable talking about is vitamin D3. And, and the usual vitamin D3 scale is 30. The safe reference range is 30 nanograms per milliliter to 100 nanograms per milliliter. And if your D3 levels are 30 nanograms per milliliter, you get sun a couple days a year in the summer. It's impossible to get 100. So I don't know why it goes that high. Um, I was in the sun for 10 hours a day taking an incredibly high vitamin D3 supplement dosage. And my blood levels were 75. And that was 10 hours a day in the sun as an Italian person taking 10,000 IU D3 per day. So for them to say that it's okay to get no sun and okay to be a sun god doesn't make sense, does it? So deficiencies of vitamin D3, uh, most people are deficient. And this is, uh, if there's anything you guys are going to learn from this podcast uh, that, that would make an impact on anyone's life that you should mention to other people, it would be the, the importance of vitamin D3 and how overlooked it is. And how almost everyone is deficient uh, because going back to indigenous people, as always, their blood levels of D3, I have a study it was done on, it was actually done on an Arctic civilization. So keep in mind, Arctic area D3 levels, their, their D3 levels after the winter, when they, they depleted their D3 stores, were around 40, which is higher than pretty much everyone now in America. And these are Arctic people after a long winter. In the summer, before the winter, end of summer, their D3 levels were 65, 70. And that was the amount of D3 that was adequate to survive the summer. Uh, not the summer, I'm sorry. That's the amount of D3 that was adequate to survive the winter. So their D3 would go from 65, the winter happens, goes down to 40, 35. Summer comes back around, animals are on pasture, animals are getting sunlight. These people are getting sunlight. They consume the high quality animal foods that have vitamin D3. Their D3 blood levels go back up to 65 over the summer. And the same thing happens again in the winter. So humans have this natural cycle of vitamin D3 uh, that is going up and down. So this is uh, how this ties into blood work and human nature. To me, we have a very clear example of what our blood levels should be in nature. And the medical guidelines are clearly incorrect. So to me, we know what other medical guidelines are incorrect really becomes a question. Uh, that being said, I think, I mean, I think they're pretty close, you know, because, you know, when most people do get their blood tested, most people don't really have any irregularities. So, uh, but the D3 one to me stands out a lot as something that is incorrect. And to me, the cholesterol one, uh, you know, at the cholesterol level between people vary so much and, and try, I, I don't know why people don't talk about triglycerides more uh, for that reason. Um, I will say glucose is a very important indicator, but as we said, uh, you know, it, it would be nice to be able to get all the blood work we want, but uh, for most people, it's expensive health coverage, things like that. You can't just get your doctor to write you scripts every two weeks. There's a lot of, especially where I am in New York, there's a lot of laws around, I can't order blood work from outside of New York. I have to get a doctor to write the script and to get a doctor to write a script, you know, it gets expensive. You know, I can't just go to my doctor and say, I want to test my testosterone every two weeks. What I have to do is I got to go to that doctor, get my testosterone tested. Then I got to go to another doctor and I have to go to a first in initial consultation visit because I've never been to that doctor before. It gets expensive. It's difficult to get blood work. It would be nice to have all this research done, but let's just say there's not a lot of money in people being healthy. Well, again, Frank, um, we're coming up on our time a little bit here, but 
I mean, yeah. you, you've just got so many great opinions. I've really enjoyed uh, exploring some of them. I know we've only just mm -hmm. touched a little bit of what you have stored yeah, of up. Of course, there. no, I think we went over some good stuff here. Yeah. Okay. So, get a general idea. so at this stage now, um, if someone was to start following you, keep in touch with you, sort of see what you're up to, what are the best places for them to do that? Sure, of course, my YouTube channel, Frank Tefano. I've got hundreds of videos, seeing as I do them every day. Uh, if you guys want to check some things out, that's a great resource. I do have some videos that are general, pretty general summaries. On my Instagram, it's really just selfies of me and steak. You're not going to learn too much on my Instagram. <laughs> on my Twitter, uh, I do post stuff on my Twitter from time to time about studies and research. Uh, but mo most of the stuff is going to be on my YouTube channel. And uh, if you guys do want to tune into live streams, on, I usually, I'm usually live streaming on Saturday, or you can look at the past live streams on my YouTube channel. A lot of questions come up. And uh, I mean, I am working on a both a book and a, a what's it called a um, a video course. What do they call them? Um, but I'm working on a video course that will explain all of these things in a two to three hour time period, hopefully, uh, because you know it really is a lot of information. And uh, just to break it down for people, the four elements that I go by are your diet, which we spoke about mostly in this, um, the sun, which we briefly touched on with vitamin D three. Uh, we didn't touch on exercise. And we didn't touch on water. You know, water is a pretty big topic uh, in regards to negative and positives. But those are the four principles I go by. So if you guys do want to know more about that, uh, definitely check out my YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash C slash Frank Tufano. Frank Tufano on Instagram, Frank Tufan on Twitter. I do have a website, frank-tufano.com. Uh, you guys can check that out as well. Uh, but uh, no, Gary, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I hope you guys, uh, as always, take everything with a grain of salt or a lot of salt. As long as it's not Himalayan pink salt, it's okay. And Perfect. as long as you guys don't sous vide your steaks, you can follow my channel. <laughs> Again, Frank, I think you're going to get quite a few more followers from this, uh, this episode. So thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Gary.